<laughs> Although I will say about Plato that headmasters will, will come to me and they'll say, what books should I read about, about you know, starting a school or leading a school? My answer is The Republic. And they'll say, well, what's that got to do with starting a school? Or why would you read something so philosophical? My answer is because Plato founded the academy around 400 BC, completely transformed Western culture, and it lasted until about 500 AD. So if you'd like to start a school that lasts a thousand years, I recommend reading the best. So as a consultant, we're always looking for best practices. Since they aren't being done now, we need books. <laughs> It's a great privilege, great honor to be here. I, I, um, I didn't know the um, tone that was going to be here. One of, the, one of the concerns I had in my preparations was I didn't know who the audience was going to be. I knew that it was going to be basically critiquing Common Core. That gave me an indication that it probably wouldn't be a bunch of progressive educators. <laughs> but I wasn't entirely sure what kind of audience I'd be speaking to, and furthermore, I'm not really here to talk directly about the Common Core, but to discuss one area that apparently is going to be affected by it. My understanding is that Common Core wants an increase in informational texts. They want to increase the reading level of informational text to something like 70%. And now there's all kinds of argumentation about where that's supposed to be and so on, but practically speaking, which is often different from the intentions or stated intentions, um, Apparently, the English teachers who are looking at the Common Core are the ones who are paying the price. How do you teach English with informational text? Apparently, the goal of, of the Common Core is to have a bunch of students who are capable of reading instructions. And, and, and I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think that's a joke. I think that really is one of the main intentions, is to, is to produce slaves. I'm a little confused also because all these years, Common, or sorry, public education has been presenting itself as the champion of imagination, right? The progressive is all about imagination and non-restrictions and suddenly, and all that sort of thing. And suddenly now it's about, it's about information. Now I have my suspicions about why this might be the case, but those all arise from fairy tales, so they're not welcome into the discussion. <laughs> But my point in this talk is very, very simple. Very simple. We need better bumper stickers. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that De Tocqueville, because that's how I heard his name pronounced. I don't know, I'm not literate. I heard a really good word from De Tocqueville this morning. Everybody recite this with me. This is one of the classical maneuvers we do in, in kindergarten and first grade. We want to hear kids repeat things, okay? So everybody repeat after me. Free people rule themselves. Free people rule themselves. Free people rule themselves. Free people rule themselves. One more. Free people rule themselves. Free people rule themselves. Okay, now if any of you is an entrepreneur, go out and make a bumper sticker and give me the credit for it. Wait, no, that's, that's not actually what I, what I wanted to talk about. The actual thing, the actual point that I want to make, and it is simple, is that children need to read they need to be told and they need to have read to them great imaginative literature. And what I'm talking about here is fairy tales, folk tales, mythology, Bible stories, even their own family stories. In fact, just and of all places, I was at my chiromaniac's office the other day and I was reading um, Bottom Line. Have you ever seen the Bottom Line? It gives you all the tips you need to live successfully. One of the things it pointed out was that children who know their own family story are more adaptable, more well-adjusted, and children who, in fact, the, the author said something along the lines of it's the number one correlation of happiness in adults is how well they know their own family story. I was intrigued by that. And by the way, not just the good stuff. Not just the good stuff. My mother, for example, was a member of the Hitler Youth. Oh. See, now that gets a reaction, and I'm just going to leave it at that. <laughs> but I have a question for you. How many of you, when you were little, were read to? I'm not surprised by that, but I'm certainly pleased by it. 
I'd like to get three or four things. What are, what are some of the favorite things that your parents read to you when you were little? Any, anybody, just raise your hand, I'll call on you. Secret garden, good, good secret garden. That's obviously imaginative when you have secrets, good. Good, yes. Yes, Laura Ingalls Wilder. Now that's an example of a story that was completely destroyed for me by my second grade teacher. That and Charlotte's Web. I cannot pick up Wilder and, 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 and uh, who wrote Charlotte's Web? E.B. White. E. White, right. I can't read those books because they always, I always associate them with my second and third grade teacher who took the boat paddle to me so often. <laughs> Sometimes justly, often not. <laughs> but, but, having said that, I cannot deny their excellence. They're excellent books. Peter but it's Pan. interesting, pardon me? Peter Pan. Peter Pan, good, good. That's been my ambition in life, is to be a Peter Pan. <laughs> in fact, I'm, I'm going to mention a story later on about my daughter Larissa, who played Peter Pan in a, in a, a high school play. She was the best ever. <laughs> <laughs> now, how come none of you, well, I only gave you three chances, but, but let's just pretend I gave you 100 because you all would have done the same thing. How come none of you gave me the name of an informational text? <laughs> I think I know the reason, because you can't dance to them. I want to read to you from three texts in succession right now. I want to read one is from my favorite 20th century novel. It's by Evelyn Waugh, and it's called Brideshead Revisited. If you haven't read Bride's Head Revisited, I recommend you put it on your list. He has a character in Bride's Head Revisited named Hooper. And Hooper, I would say, well, let me read it to you. You'll see who he represents. Hooper was no romantic. He had not, as a child, ridden with Rupert's horse or sat among the campfires at Xantha's side. At the age when my eyes were dry to all save poetry, Hooper had wept often but never for Henry's speech on St. Crispin's Day, nor for the epitaph at Thermopylae. The history they taught him had had few battles in it, but instead a profusion of detail about humane legislation and recent industrial change. Gallipoli, Balaclava, Quebec, Lepanto, Bannockburn, Roncesvalles, or something like that, and Marathon, these and the battle in the west where Arthur fell, and a hundred such names whose trumpets notes called to me irresistibly across the intervening years with all the clarity and strength of boyhood sounded in vain to Hooper. Text two, an independent review panel as a critical friend. A third practice of using data to shape school governance is the establishment of an independent review panel within the school system to monitor school performance. Compared to the first two types of practices, this third, this third is not as widely adopted in urban systems. Independent panels serve a unique accountability function. The rationale for this arrangement is grounded in the need for external verification, hold on to that phrase, of the overall district performance. Members of the independent panels are not directly associated with the work of the district, but they bring national expertise, hold on to that phrase, and outside perspectives. They are expected to use independent professional judgment, hold on to that phrase, to assess student performance and advise the district leadership on strategies that may improve district performance. This type of arrangement is different from efforts to build the data analytic capacity of the district. An example of the capacity building effort is the strategic data project funded by, guess, Bill Gates. Bill Gates. yes, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. In sending data fellows in pairs to a selected sample of urban districts, the STP collaborates closely with the research and evaluation unit of the district. STP fellows become part of the district team, now get this, to address district defined priorities offer technical resources for the districts, and then using bad grammar, and may nur nurture, not bad grammar, bad, bad uh, elocution, it messes up the scheme, and may nurture a new culture of data-driven decision-making. Isn't that exactly what we need? <laughs> 
while the good news is they are not likely to be in a position to monitor and report on district performance for public accountability purposes, which makes me wonder why I read those two paragraphs. Oh yeah, illustrative purposes. Okay, so let me read the third text. This is from a book that I also highly recommend by David Hicks called Norms and Nobility, a classic on classical education written in 1981. I believe this is the best book written on education since the abolition of man by C.S. Lewis. A new, a, a new language, torgid and unreadable, hides under the mantle of experimentation and research the volumes of common sense cloaked in gibberish now being written by many educational experts. Not only does their language make abominable prose, but it helps to suppress many of the really interesting questions involving value judgments, cultural norms, and religious truths, as well as questions touching on first and final causes and those arising from the marvelous, the transcendent, or the simple craving for justice and goodness. When do you think a child starts to simply crave justice and goodness? Is it, is, it, is it fair to say they're born with it? Yes. Now, it is true that by the time they're three, they're able to corrupt the claim that something isn't fair. <laughs> but by the time they're three, they've got some notion of what fairness is. And it's that word transcendent that leaps off the page to me. It's that word transcendent. How do you measure the transcendent? What kind of research can reveal the transcendent to you? What degree of Oedipus complex of a different sort would lead you to poke out your own eyes in such a way that you don't realize that you are a transcendent being? And how long does it take for a culture to untranscendentalize <laughs> its children? Peter Kraft, in his, in his review or, or uh, champion book, championing of the, uh, the Lord of the Rings, uh, the philosophy of Tolkien, he writes these words. He, he writes in, on pages 14, 15, 16, and 17 some amazing words. But this is how he summarizes. The deepest healing is the healing of the deepest wounds. The deepest wound is the frustration of the deepest need. The deepest need is the need for meaning, purpose, and hope. And that is what the Lord of the Rings offers us. American thought put, took a pretty nasty turn before it started. <laughs> Around the time we were being established as a country, I mean as, a, as colonies, Francis Bacon was writing his, his, I have to watch my adjectives. He was writing an unfortunate book <laughs> called The Great Instauration, which means the great restarting, basically. We need to start over with education, he was saying. And here's the basic premise of Bacon's very laudable, very insightful book. His basic premise of all his works, really. And you've seen this probably carved into the walls of universities. Knowledge is power. Knowledge is power. Now, he wrote that around 1600, around the same time when Descartes wrote, I, be, I, I think, therefore I am. And those two philosophies, rationalism and empiricism, were at war with each other until the time of Newton, who is the patron saint of the Enlightenment because he brought Descartes and Bacon together in his Newtonian physics. And then Einstein, of course, showed that to be wrong, and now there's a 15-year-old boy in Canada that is about to prove that Einstein's relativity is wrong. Shifting sands of physics, they don't make a good foundation. But what was Bacon talking about? when he said knowledge is power. Notice, please, that he did not say knowledge gives power. 
He said knowledge is power. The logic of that argument is what led Darwin to conclude in somewhat simplistic arguments that nobody believes anymore, that all we are is adapters. Now with, with uh, neo-Darwinism, I understand that there's been genetics brought in and so on, so it's a different argument, but nobody believes in Darwinism anymore. In fact, Darwinism, when he died, had, had become a neo-Darwinist. <laughs> or Lamarckian, actually. But the logic, or the, let me rephrase that, not the logic, but the metaphysic of the Baconian argument is that you know that something is true. You know something when, as William James put it, you know it's cash value. Now, he meant that analogically. He didn't mean that in terms of, you know, you can sell it. But he did mean that you can use it. You can make use of it. And the use you can make of knowledge is its value and its validity. When John Dewey wrote what I believe to be his core essay on education, it's a very short one, you can get it for free online, it's about 12 pages in a Word document, and it's called On the Impact of Darwinism Upon Philosophy. It's the most important document on American education, in my opinion, for the opening sentence. He says this, when Charles Darwin wrote his book on the origin of species, everybody knew that a scientific revolution had occurred. But what even the experts failed to see was that an intellectual revolt had occurred that introduced a new intellectual temper. And those are the two crucial points. There's an intellectual revolt, and the question has to be asked, if Darwin supposedly introduced an intellectual revolt, against what was he revolting? Dewey explains in detail, and the way I would put it is he was revolting against truth. He was revolting against knowable truth. Now that's not how Dewey put it, he was revolting against what now we have to say is absolute truth because apparently there's this other thing called relative truth which is a contradiction, an oxymoron, a contradiction in terms. The only kind of truth there is is absolute truth. If it's true, it's absolutely true. Circumstances only make up absolute truth, you see? But what happens then is, is Dewey, sorry, Darwin comes along and Dewey uses Darwin so he uses Darwin to argue that truth is not something that we perceive with the soul. After all, we don't have a soul. But truth is the ability to adapt to circumstances. Knowledge is the ability to adapt to circumstances. There's nothing transcendent about it. Once knowledge is reduced, the knower is reduced. And the fundamental problem with the things we read and that we have our children read in our culture is that it's all rooted in a reduced view of man. The book I suggested is the best book prior to Hicks in the 20th century on education. Do you remember the title, C.S. Lewis? The Abolition of Man. Let me read something to you out of that book. <coughs> Sorry, it's out of order here. What is now common to all men is a mere abstract universal. Now, now, Lewis is writing in 1943, I believe, and he's talking about the idea of man, okay, mankind. What is mankind? He says, what everybody has in common now is a mere abstract universal, an HCF, and I have no idea what he means by HCF, so if anybody can tell me, please let me know. But he goes on, listen to this now. And man's conquest of himself means simply the rule of the conditioners over the conditioned human material. The world of post-humanity. Now there is a school in the humanities, in, in, in the uh, literary departments, I think it started probably at Duke where all this stuff seems to begin in America, called post-humanism. There is a movement, you, uh, Time Magazine had a cover article about this, it was great, all about how by 2050 we'll, be, we'll have graduated beyond humanity. We might even have attained immortality, God forbid. The conditioners over the conditioned human material. The world of post-humanity, which some knowingly and some unknowingly, nearly all men in all nations are at present laboring to produce. That's humbling. 
In 1943, C.S. Lewis argued that nearly all men in all nations are laboring together to produce a world of post-humanity. I cannot read this without examining what I am doing when I teach. I cannot read this without asking myself, what is that person, person that I am teaching? Is it an object for me to condition? Is it a person that, uh, is it rather an object, not a person, but an object that is controlled by the environment around it? And therefore, if we can control the environment, we use the word socialize for this, if we can socialize the child properly, then he will become what? What will he become? He'll become what we want him to be, and, and they're fighting about that. I guess he'll become either a Democrat or a cog in the economy. Right? One of those two things. Or both, yeah. I guess that could happen. My favorite opening line in all of literature comes from a children's book. You may have heard of it. I call it the boy who read the wrong books. You'll probably know from the first line. There was a boy called Eustace Clarence Scrub, and he almost deserved it. I've been laughing at that for 25 years. His parents called him Scrub. No, sorry, his parents called him Eustace Clarence, and his schoolmasters called him Scrub. I can't tell you how his friends spoke to him, for he had none. He didn't call his father and mother, father and mother, but Harold and Alberta. They were very up-to-date and advanced people. They were vegetarians. <laughs> Non-smokers. And teetotalers. And they wore a special kind of underclothes. <laughs> in their house, there was very little furniture and very few clothes on the beds, and windows were always open. Eustace Clarence liked animals, especially beetles, if they were dead and pinned on a card. He liked books, if they were books of information and had pictures of grain elevators and of fat foreign children doing exercises in model schools. <laughs> Now later on in the story, Eustace has a conversion experience, quite literally. He's converted into a dragon. And this is what, um, he, he's, he's coming to a dragon's cave, and this is what Lewis says. Something was crawling. Uh, Lewis, I mean, Eustace is looking into the cave. Something was crawling. Worse still, still, something was coming out. Edmund or Lucy or you would have recognized it at once. But Eustace had read none of the right books. <laughs> the thing that came out of the cave was something he had never even imagined. A long lead-colored snout, dull red eyes, no feathers or fur, a long lithe body that trailed on the ground, legs whose elbows went up higher than its back like a spider's, cruel claws, bats' wings that made a rasping noise on the stones, yards of tail and the initials CC. And the two lines of, that was a joke, and the two lines of smoke were coming from its two nostrils. There I could have put, formed a CC. He never said the word dragon to himself, nor would it have made things any better if he had. Now here's the practical point. But perhaps, if he had known something about dragons, he would have been a little surprised at this dragon's behavior. A couple pages later he says, most of us know what we should expect to find in a dragon's lair, but as I said before, Eustace had read only the wrong books. They had a lot to say about exports and imports and governments and drains, but they were weak on dragons. <laughs> That is why he was so puzzled at the surface on which he was lying. Now, one of my favorite discoveries as a grandfather is how beautiful the surface of life is. I used to think that you had to be deep, you know, so you'd go to college or something and learn how to think deep thoughts, and then you could show off what you knew and all that stuff. Well, I gave up on all that, and now I get to just look at the surface of life. And it strikes me 
that we're awfully deeply puzzled by the surface on which we're lying. Maybe it's because we don't read the right books. Three things are true about children that I think are absolutely crucial and are utterly overlooked in whatever I've seen of the Common Core. The first thing is that they're artists by nature. The second is that by nature they're ethicists, or let me say idealists. And third, they're philosophers. And what I mean by they're artists is that from the day they're born, they think in terms of analogies. Right? We think in terms of analysis, numbers, statistics, as abstract and meaningless as possible. Children aren't like that. Children think in terms of analogies. That's why fairy tales are so utterly important to them. That's why the fairy tales that they read are so utterly important to them. When my daughter Larissa was in high school, I mean kindergarten, about the same. When she was in kindergarten, <laughs> she played Chicken Little. And I will never forget this. She was, the, she was the cutest Chicken Little the world has ever seen. Go ahead, admit it. While she was playing Chicken Little, she was convinced, of course, that the sky was falling. And so because the sky was falling, she ran around yelling, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. And then other creatures from the farm started to follow her. At the end, they were led by the fox, who also was convinced, apparently, that the sky was falling. They were led by the fox to the fox's hole, at which point my clever little daughter made a trick, um, what would you call it? She outsmarted the fox and escaped. And I've always been struck by how horrible that was. At the moment it happened, I thought, this is horrible. And I couldn't figure out why for about 10 seconds. And then I realized, it's because she just lied. That's not what happens. If you go around crying out that the sky is falling, and everybody follows you thinking the sky is falling, it is a guarantee that a fox will join you. And you're already saying what the fox wants you to think, that the sky is falling. And so you will follow that fox. And you will follow that fox into its lair. And when you do, you won't outsmart it. You will, like in the fairy tale, you will be eaten. It's extremely important for five-year-olds to learn that. Think of the, uh, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe when Edmund is, is visiting with the White Witch. I mean, what's the first thing you teach a kid about strangers? Don't take candy and don't go for a ride, right? They don't get it when it's rules. That's analytical. Okay, they don't get rules. I don't get rules. They don't sing to me. I can't dance with the rules. Did you ever notice, for example, in the Bible, 69 chapters of stories and then 10 simple rules. followed by 25 chapters of the most gorgeous building you could ever imagine. Think of it. Every chapter being a revelation of the human soul where it meets Christ. Every chapter describing the love of the Father for the Son and the Son for us. Unbelievable. 69 chapters of stories. And then the rules. You go to school, what's the first thing you learn? Rules. First day. Any questions? <laughs> my, my time is actually up.